has helped you avert some of these things. Uh, we need each other to interpret what's going on in the world and also scripture as a hermeneutical community. But uh, that being said, uh, I want to give the floor to Dr. Mark. Mark, uh, make sure he's unmuted. Dr. Mark, what in the world is going on? How do you explain people still saying Trump is going to be the president, even people like Kenneth Copeland? I don't want to get you in trouble because you know some of these people. So I'm the, I'm the one who's naming the name. But what is going on? Morning, Joe. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to weigh in and share. Um, I, I want to be. Um, uh, let me frame my answer and my answers. Uh, what I'm going to share from this perspective. I I speak um, from being within the tribe, not outside the tribe. I am very much a part of. Uh, our Pentecostal heritage, I value and uh, deeply respect um, the prophetic function as it is revealed in scripture. Um, what I think right now in light of your direct question about what's going on now, if I were to speak from a perspective of psychology what you are looking at is a combination of things that would be tied to disconfirmation that's related to confirmation bias and uh, what would be called, um, uh, if we were to label it a disorder, and I've observed some of the behaviors in the language and some of them are, are in a place where they would be diagnosed psychologically. And I realize we demonize all this stuff. So for all of you guys that demonize academia, um, please forgive me because I, I, I know too much. Uh, and, and if you're gonna demonize it, uh, we really not gonna have a conversation. But for those of you that respect scholarship, respect the fact that, there are, that, that we love God with our minds as well as our hearts. Uh, there are real disorders that we're watching play out, not the least of which is, is um, a perceptual psychotic disorder, a delusional disorder. And there are many, many delusional disorders are tied to government and government conspiracy theories. And we're listening to the rhetoric of men and women that are absolutely delusional, uh, but we are defending the prophetic to the hilt, not realizing we're committing uh, idolatry and some are blaspheming. So those are serious things to me. What we're watching right now is the passive judgment of God, but we may actually see that passive judgment become uh, something far more um, serious in the days that lie ahead if there's not repentance. So I don't know, Joe, if that answers that question or not. I, I, it's a condensed que answer to that question. So when we see someone like, um, I'm gonna draw out a name, you are not doing as I am, uh, Hank Huneman, who is insisting that Trump is still gonna be the president uh, in spite of that, the, you know, even Trump conceded it seems and all that. Or when we see other people do these things, Forget about the word Hank Kuhneman, because you might know him and I don't want to get, get in trouble with that. But uh, is it possible, we're not going to say it is, is it possible that this is tied to some kind of delusion uh, or psychotic delusion? Or does this have to do with the fact that there's some kind of psychological term that shows that people dig in their heels even more? when they don't want to face that they're wrong or they don't want to face reality? Is there some kind of psychological term or experience you have for this? Well, yeah, I, I mean, and certainly within, within the nature of um, delusion, I think we can hear those words. And if we don't understand what psychologists mean when they say that, but yes, there can be there can be del delusional disorder is it's easily accessible. Um, uh, uh, if you look up um, the American Psychological Association dictionary, 
uh, and they will describe all the delusional disorders. Um, the, the fact is that when we, when there's cognitive dissonance, in other words, when I'm saying something that is contrary to what I know, there's a disconfirmation bias that is created that causes the person who has a need to be right to dig their heels in. And, and what's happening right now is you are seeing a divorce of the person. And I let, um, maybe if I take, can I take this theologically first? Yeah, please. Okay. Within our movement of independent tribes, um, when these kind of utterances uh, are generated, um, there's a profound lack of institutional structure and framework. We demonize anything that's not independent, not realizing we're divorcing ourselves from the tradition with a capital T and the communion of the saints for 2,000 years. But we make up our own traditions and tr traditions and what makes it evident that we lack institutional structure and framework is our lack of theological and philosoph philosophical structure in our prophesying. And um, it seems obvious to me that we, when we do that, we have no clear understanding of how to read the scripture. Um, it assumes a kind of a framework that our tribe doesn't want to assume, though it's been available theologically from the beginning. And these errors were in place in Montanism in the first century and were condemned by the early church as heretical. Exegetical fallacies make no sense in our third wave movement, uh, precisely, and in our third wave churches, because we don't have a proper methodology for interpreting the text. We become our own authority. And so what you're seeing right now is the authority is, I said this, God said it, you can't question it. Well, that divorces us from the canon uh, which was canonized in the fourth century, and it divorces us from the doctrine of the communion of the saints. So that means I've got to reject everything that Irenaeus might have said, that, that um, Aquinas might have said, that Augustine might have said, because we don't value the doctors of the church who have already weighed in centuries before we got here on the abuse of prophecy. And so I think what we, we're dealing with is a number of exegetical fallacies and we can't handle critique or pushback because our ego is too easily offended. And we realize we, we end up revealing a narcissistic tendency that's part of the culture we're in that's deeply dangerous and rooted right now. It seems to me that it's rooted right now, not only in a lack of a, 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 an unwillingness to have critique and pushback, but a profound lack of methodology and uninformed methodology and a profound misreading of scripture that leads to erroneous speculations and conclusions that we're calling revelation. And uh, it seems as though many of them are equating their prophecies as if it were scripture. They're yeah. saying, you don't yeah. believe. Yeah. You don't and believe they, they not believe in God. Yeah, so they become the canon. They've divorced themselves from the canon and now they're the only authority and they can't be judged. So the content of their prophecies can't be judged because you can't, because they're prophets and they're actually, a, they're proof texting. They're, I tried to come up with all the exegetical fallacies. There are about 20 of them, but within the prophetic utterances and within the attitudes of the people that are defending them, um, there are semantic anachronisms. There is appeal to unknown or unlikely meanings. There's verbal parallelomania. There's selective and prejudicial use of evidence, and there's false disjunctions. Uh, there's oversimplified logic ruling. Those are five exegetical fallacies that our tribe wouldn't know what to do with and probably curse me if I push back, but it's lunacy, it's idiocy, it's stupidity, and it shows up in the ego-driven way in which we defend our ignorance. And there's a need for deep, deep, deep reform and repentance in our tribe. What I've been uh, teaching our church and leaders is that more than trying to get a word, we need to develop discernment. And according to Hebrews 5, discernment only comes from practice and knowing the word of God. Um, and I believe one of the reasons why we're seeing this, uh, this shallow show from the popular prophets today is because they have a lack of depth, not only in theology, but in just knowing God's ways. 
Uh, a lot of it is just they go to God to get a word instead of just pouring over the scriptures to know God. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So, so, so let's so let's go back to scripture and let's just let's just deal with let's stay in the New Testament for a moment. And let's let's approach the epistle of First Corinthians, the earliest of all the New Testament uh, writings. This is First Corinthians is written prior to Mark's gospel, prior to Matthew's gospel, prior to Luke's. Luke's was written later. John's was written quite a bit later. But of all the New Testament canon, the first epistle to circulate prior to being canonized was the epistle of Paul to Corinth. And one of the things that I think we need to remember is that the oral tradition is what sustained the church until um, they began to write these things down. And when Paul is writing 1 Corinthians, it's not considered scripture. These are letters that he is writing to churches that have been formed in the story of Jesus. And so what we do, we have no methodology. Uh, I'm, I'm, in our tribe, we have no faithful methodology. So we, if we want to learn about prophecy, we go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and we ignore chapters 1 to 11, and don't read it as a letter. And we think Paul is doing theology when, as a father, he's seeking to correct a bunch of people that think they're more spiritual than anyone else because they talk in tongues and prophesy. The whole problem the, that he's addressing from the beginning is Gnosis and Sophia, which when we get to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and we look at what he calls a word of Gnosis and a word of Sophia, we think we know what he's talking about because we imprint on that Howard Carter on the gifts of the spirit. And we and that's fine. I, I, had, I have respect for the late Howard Carter. But when we go to Howard Carter as our go-to or Kenneth Hagin as our go-to, and we don't go back to what is, let's, let's deal with the text from a literary critical perspective, from a narrative theological perspective, two different methodologies. Paul opens up the church, the, the letter to the church at Corinth with the fact that he thanks God for the fact that they have been enriched with all spiritual gifts. So he's not going to condemn them. He's going to thank God for their enrichment, but he's going to make them aware by verse nine that they have not a clue about what the fellowship of the son is. So first Corinthians one nine, we have this, this statement by Paul about the, they've been called into the fellowship of the son. So before we even get to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, we need to ask the question, Paul, what are you arguing for when you speak of the fellowship of the son? Now, then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 2 to say that when I was with you, I sought to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So so now all of a sudden, as he introduces, we do speak a wisdom among the mature. It's a wisdom based on the narrative that forms us, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what Paul is doing there is equating the Exodus event of Moses under the old covenant with the Exodus event of the cross that leads us from the emancipates us from slavery and brings us into sonship and daughterhood. And so for Paul, the wisdom from above by the spirit, the wisdom that we speak is a cross-shaped wisdom that's based on the narrative of Christ delivering us from the domain of darkness and translating us into the kingdom of the son of his love. And we combine spiritual thoughts with spiritual words as we speak that narrative. The gospel is the narrative of an Exodus event. So by the time we get to um, the gifts, the charisms, those charisms are intended, especially prophecy, to be the testimony, the martyria, the cross-shaped content of the suffering lamb and what he embodies as the incarnate son. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the moment we divorce prophecy from that, and then make up our own idea about what we think prophets are, we're already on unholy territory. And so I would dismiss summarily anything that doesn't flow from a place of this is about Jesus. This is not a conflating of 
And so, I mean, if, if, I mean, I can pull a thousand and one scriptures, but if we go back and look at the ancient prophets and what they prophesied, we look at how they prophesied about the person of God, how they prophesied about the glory of God, how they spoke of God's desire for intimacy. If we look at Mary's Magnificat, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior, for he who is mighty has done great things and holy is his name. This is is a prophetic song. Zacharias, when he prophesies of his son, John the Baptist, it's a lengthy prophecy about the sunrise from on high, visiting us and preparing the way for the Lord and establishing a paradigm in which John, once Zacharias is gone, John is going to be raised alone, but he will have passed down to him these prophetic words by which in the wilderness he will feed on and the spirit will speak to him from what has been handed down to him and enlighten him as to his calling as to the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets, but who will prepare the way for the one who he will be able to say prophetically, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now you have to ask yourself the question, if in the New Testament and the Old Testament, the prophets prophesied of the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, then what are we doing conflating Americanism and Christian nationalism with the testimony of Jesus? We are on very dangerous, idolatrous ground. And when we claim to be prophets to the nations, if I can go there for a minute, can I go there for a minute? The, yeah. the sheer lack of faithful methodology and faithful interpretation that would cause us, just because I have a Twitter feed that reaches the whole world doesn't make me a prophet to the nations. Just because I have an Instagram feed where 3000 people like my false prophecy, it doesn't make me a prophet to the nations. It means I have a need for attention and a need for approval. And whatever I say, as long as I get an amen, I must be right. So we don't any longer abide by the Sermon on the Mount and the sobering words of Jesus about the prophetic and understand if we look at the Beatitudes that the entire flow of the Beatitudes culminates in so they persecuted the prophets before you. Where's the meekness? Where's the brokenness? There's, where, and because Jesus is very clear about the arrogance and the content and the ways in which what we're seeing is being played out as a passive judgment. And so if it isn't about the New Testament exodus, so let's, let's take a look at even New Testament prophetic examples. Let's, let's look at Agabus. Let's look at Agabus. Agabus is sent from Jerusalem down to Antioch as a proven, and history, history bears out the presence of Agabus with, with, with the apostles of Jerusalem. He has a sense and a word that a famine is coming. Now, he is sent to Antioch, not to say, hey, guys, I got a word from God, a famine is coming. That, that misses the whole point. Where does that fit within the narrative of the cross-shaped life? He knows economically when that famine comes, the Jerusalem saints are going to be boxed out economically from the game playing that Rome is going to do to raise the price of wheat. And because they are oppressed and marginalized, they are not going to have the economic stamina to be able to afford grain to make bread. And because Jerusalem goes through the major trade routes of the ancient Near East, all the big merchants are going to price gorge all these things. And the Jerusalem saints who are already poor and persecuted for embracing Christ and coming out of Judaism are going to lose their property, which we find out about in the book of Hebrews, and we find out that they're severely persecuted, he doesn't go down to say, hey guys, on my Twitter feed, did you see I had a word about a famine coming? No, he says, the reason I'm here is that the apostles in Jerusalem want you to partake of what it takes to support them. This famine is coming, and our brothers and sisters are going to need your financial support so they can afford bread when the famine comes. That's the end game of what Jesus does when prophetic words are given. When Agabus then goes later on, and grabs Paul's belt and puts it around him and bows down and says, this is what's going to happen to the man who goes to Jerusalem. At that point, Paul says, and all the people say, oh, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't go. Paul looks at that prophetic word and says, you know, that's, that's an accurate word. I'm already prepared for that. But do not impose your interpretation on it because I know that bonds and affliction await me in Jerusalem. I'm going for the cause of the cross 
and, and you're sorrowing needlessly and don't force an interpretation on something that I already know is part of the purpose of God. And it's a cross shaped purpose. And the moment we get beyond that, and the moment that does not become the plumb line, it is not true prophecy. It is not the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit of the age. And what we're hearing is the zeitgeist being prophesied by Christian nationalists and by Christian Americanism, which is a relatively new development in American evangelicalism in the last 60 years. But when the Pentecostals embrace it, it is absolutely shameful because we are not evangelicals, we are Pentecostals. Well, you definitely speak in my language. Uh, my understanding of hermeneutics is based on biblical theology rather than systematics, uh, knowing the narrative and bringing the whole narrative of scripture, Old and New Testament together to interpret a passage. That's what you did with 1 Corinthians 2, when you talked about how I didn't know anything except Jesus Christ, him crucified. So the whole story of Israel, the whole story of everything is culminating in Christ. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 that if anyone speaks by the spirit, they have to say Jesus is Lord. So some of these prophecies, as you said, driven by Christian nationalism, by Americanism, are not saying Jesus is Lord as much as perpetuating a political ideology. Yeah. And that's even though some of it is good, in other words, uh, policies on pro-life and marriage and all that, we believe in all of that. So how can we discern when it's wrong, even if some of the policies are right? Okay, so let's let's take a let me let me go back to the Jesus is Lord. What most people, even in our tribe, don't know is that that Jesus is Lord is the tetragrammaton. Jesus is Yahweh. This is God in the flesh. It's the tetragrammaton. It's not Lord as in the Middle Ages serfdom lords and fiefdoms that had property and stuff. This is Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. And therefore, there, there are no rivals. So when we prophesy out of nationalism, we have to ask ourselves this question, if we're going to be faithful to the canon, and the canon, the plumb line to me, is the, what has been recognized post the Nicene Council as the, the New Testament and the Old Testament. By the way, most of us may not realize, but the Old Testament wasn't canonized until the New, New Testament came into existence because the ancient Jews had a problem with how the, the new Christian sect was interpreting everything in the Old Testament about Jesus. And so now they started arguing as ancient rabbinic scholars, we need to know what we hold to be true, but it was the Christian canonization of the text that gave the Jews a canon called the Old Testament. And we, we often don't know that. And, and we're arguing from, first and foremost, um, we've got a whole tribe that doesn't know what the regular fide is. So we argue, I, you know, I'm, I, I was, I, I'm the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. Okay, so let's go to what is the word? What is your theology of the incarnation? Because he is, his title is the word of God. Secondly, we don't have a canonization of scripture until the fourth century. So what is it that makes the scripture the scripture? What makes the scripture the scripture is that is the unveiling of the story of God as father, son, and spirit. Hence, before you could get in the baptismal waters and become a part of the community, you had to say these words, I believe in God, the father, the almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from then. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we now have the three articles of the creed revealing the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and what was the Apostles' Doctrine. We all think we know what the apostles' doctrine is, and then we claim that we're apostles, and we teach whatever we want based on our, 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 our false notion of what is revelatory. But none of us, I, when was the last time you heard anybody in our stream preach on the triune Godhead and the self-revealing God who reveals himself in the incarnation? We do not abide faithful even in our preaching. And so... When it says Jesus is Lord or Jesus is Yahweh, he is 
the very self-expression of God the Father who cannot be seen, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father perfectly reveals who the Father is. So that by the Spirit then becomes the administrator of the church, the ecclesia, the communion of the saints, and what comes, and prophets have to be formed in the narrative of the community because they speak from and on behalf of the story that holds us together. They don't independently get a word in a prayer closet. They have come with us from Abraham and Sarah, from barrenness to birth, and then from Isaac and Rebecca to sonship and identity in Christ, and then from from Eve, and then from Jacob and and uh, Joseph and Rachel into a place of knowing that they exist exist even if they have authority to lay their lives down for their brothers as Christ did. And then we move from there from our nomadic existence into what it means to know what it's like to be enslaved to sin and know what it's like to need to be liberated by a liberator and then know what it's like to come into our inheritance, which is Christ himself, having been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's all Christ-centered. What makes scripture scripture is that it is the story of Jesus. It is the story of how the Father progressively reveals himself through Christ by the Spirit. That's what makes scripture authoritative. It's not that you can extract a verse and say, I'm a prophet to the nations. No, you're not. The term prophet to the nations is an Old Testament concept that was tied to those that served Israel in relationship to their priestly function to bring the promise of loving kindness to the nations, but they took their priesthood and exalted it as if they were above everybody else, instead of being a kingdom of priests who, like Christ, would lay his life down for the nations. But when we get to the story of Jesus, he is Israel, my son. And so the fulfillment of Old Testament Israel is, behold, my son, whom I've called out of Egypt. He fully identifies. He's one of us. He's part of the story. He comes out of Egypt, and he is the, the only prophet, priest, and king to the nations. In Christ, we are elected in Christ, but the only prophet to the nations in the new covenant is Christ. We simply serve functionally to declare that his prophethood is what is going to govern the ultimate thing that goes on in the purpose of God. He is the prophet to the nations, not us. We need to take a big humble pill and begin to say, you know what, the minute I equate Ephesians 4 prophets with the kind of authority that Jeremiah had, I'm already on dangerous ground. Aquinas would destroy that. Augustine would destroy that. Tertullian would destroy that, though he became a part of the Montanist movement and believed in an, an open canon. And so that the prophet, and, and here, here we've got our friends saying, I believe the scripture is authority, but they're behaving as if their prophecy is greater than scripture, which is why you've now you've got all these people deceived and believing, well, the prophet said it, so it has to come to pass. Well, we're not, we're not willing to judge every prophetic word anymore because we're popular and celebrity has killed what it means to glorify Christ. And we are addicted to celebrity. Look, guys, I have been involved in the, in the popular world for a long time. I have had the privilege of standing on platforms. I've touched in one moment 40 million people worldwide on many occasions. I know what it's like to get 8 million hits on my website. But none of that means anything to me. None of it. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't asking for it. I wasn't vying for it. I wasn't jockeying for it. What matters to me is a faithful witness to Christ. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit, capital S of prophecy, because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prophecy, just like he's the spirit of grace, just like he's the spirit of creation, just like he's the spirit of faith. But we don't know that because we think we've got revelation. So we have, um, again, you're speaking my language, you know, understanding the story, biblical theology, which is more important than just inductive study um, and more important than uh, just looking at the text uh, in its immediate context. If you don't know the whole story, not only can you interpret scripture, but you can't even get prophecy right 
in terms of the motivation for it. Hebrews 1, it says, God in times past spoke to the fathers through the prophets, and in his last days he has spoken to us in his son. And that's basically what you're saying. But let's just get to, um, not as theological, but um, there is, again, a tendency for people to quote 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. Uh, believe the prophets and you will prosper. And some of our friends have said that, quoted that over and over again. There's a huge difference between the context of when that was spoken and today. Can you please unpack that? Yeah. So, so again, we're back to methodology. Um, what they're doing is proof texting, and it's an exegetical fallacy. And it's one of and 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 there's there are 20 exegetical fallacies, and proof texting is included within. A text out of context is a pretext for a proof text. So when I approach the scripture, if I don't have a methodology, I end up doing what I did with the promise boxes years ago in the Jesus. I pull out a promise and it's like daily divination. And the promise is fine, but if you read it out of context, you can make it say something it isn't saying. And we end up in Gnosticism when we do that. We don't even want to hear about Gnosticism and we don't even know, we, we, we defend our Gnosticism to the hilt and don't realize how heretical it is. And then we get mad if someone points it out because we're too proud to admit we, here, I'll give you an example. When I hear guys demean John Calvin, I no longer let them get away with that crap. Look, I am not a Calvinist, but I had to grow up in a Presbyterian church where I had to read Calvin's Institutes. And so now the way I shut them up is I said, if you're going to talk about Calvinism, tell me what's in the second Institutes of the four Institutes and what it's really talking about. And tell me why Calvin wrote four. Why are there four Institutes in John Calvin's theology? And when did Calvinism become the reality it is today? And do you understand that John Calvin is not the same as Calvinism? And when was the Council of Dort? And who was Theodore B? They're not, all they have is an ad hominem, I want to attack you. They're revealing their lack of intelligence, their lack of loving God with their minds, and their proof texting, which is what they're doing with 2 Chronicles 2020. A text out of context. When we get to the passage in that portion of scripture where we are dealing with conflict between the nation of Israel and neighboring states, we now have this rivalry that's going on because Jehoshaphat is close friends with um, with Elisha, but the king of Israel doesn't like Elisha because Elisha never tells him what he wants to hear, which by the way is a great thing if we want to go to Second Chronicles. When was the last time anybody corrected Donald Trump for his arrogance and his narcissism? I mean, these guys want to speak truth to power, but they want to kiss up to him when he does stuff. When you say s whole nations and you claim that it's OK and give that sanction when Christ said, what are you doing about the foreigner and the stranger? God, they're going to be held accountable to God for what comes out of their mouth. I'm sorry, but we can't get away with this crap and call it sanctified. We can't. And now, this stuff gets me upset because I feel like we have bastardized the prophetic. So when we get to this point in the story of Israel, the king of Israel doesn't like Elisha at all because he doesn't tell him what he wants to hear. He doesn't kiss up to him. And, um, and, and Elisha says, if it, weren't for the, if it weren't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even be here because Jehoshaphat is a God-fearing Judean king. And so he says, make the valley full of trenches, right? And in the process of doing that, he goes on to talk about what's going to happen as a result. And so I am talking about the right passage, correct? Yeah. So, so we, we have this picture now of this dry place where there's no water. And strategically in the battle, this is significant because this is a sign related to... So, so, so if, if, if Origen or Aquinas or Gregory of Nyssa were to look at these passages, what they're looking for is Christ. Christ becomes the hermeneutic. Once the, entire, the entirety of the revelation of Christ is revealed, they're going back to the canon 
to discover who Christ is because the prophets made careful search and inquiry as to what manner or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So this making the valley full of trenches means I'm digging something that looks like a grave. This is how Origen would probably take it. And it's gonna be filled with water. Well, there has to be the sending of the sun before there can be the sending of the spirit. And so that's allegorical interpretation. There are four layers, tropological, allegorical, anagogical, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and you, you know all that. I mean, and Pardes, the ancient rabbinic concept of Pardes, the Peshat, the Ayra, I mean, all of them. So when we look at that text, if we simply extract it to make it say something in the present moment, we are actually blind to any faithful methodology as to how to approach a text. And I would argue that in our tribe, most people have a false concept of what revelatory is, and they really don't study to show themselves approved. So no, you cannot take, put your trust in his prophets and all of a sudden equate that as if that means anybody who claims to be a prophet, we should not question anything they say. That's utter nonsense. That's tomfoolery. It's dangerous. And also the nature of prophecy, from what I know in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 14 uh, and uh and 13 actually, where it talks about how we know in part and prophesy in part. And then it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 20, that we ought to judge or test prophecies. So it seems as though the nature of prophecy in the Old Testament was different, where if they made a mistake, they were a false prophet. But in the New Testament, they allowed for mistakes. Right. Uh, and so that's a huge difference. That's why in the Old Testament, they could say, believe the prophets and you'll prophesy, uh, you'll profit, you'll prosper. But in the New Testament, there isn't that kind of dictum related to prophetic words. Can no. you understand that? Yeah, no, because the Ephesians 4 Doma gift of prophet is not equal to the foundational gift of the Old Testament prophet. Ephesians 2.18, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, is the original 12 and the Old Testament prophets. Ephesians 4 is the ascension gifts. The moment you equate the foundational prophets um, from Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Amos, Habakkuk, to what these guys are doing today, you're fundamentally forcing and misreading the text. I, in my thesis that I'm working on, on the prophetic and constructing a Pentecostal theology, I go back to Aquinas. I'm gonna read you a portion of what Aquinas says about 1 Corinthians 13. Aquinas is quite clear that deviations from the truth are entirely possible by the prophetic agent. Aquinas states clearly, prophecy is by way of being something imperfect in the genus of divine revelation. Hence it is written, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that prophecy shall be made void and that we prophesy in part, i.e. imperfectly. Aquinas is essentially declaring that to deny that prophecy is imperfect is to ignore the clear counsel here given by Paul in the text. This does not imply that the prophetic agent cannot have a genuine insight from the divine spirit. The prophet may indeed know something by an express revelation. And indeed, in addition, the prophetic agents, he says, I answer that the prophet's mind is instructed by God in two ways. In one way, by an express revelation, in another way, by a most mysterious instinct to which the human mind is subjected without knowing it, as Augustine says. Accordingly, the prophet has the greatest certitude about those things which he knows by an express revelation, and he has it for certain that they are revealed to him by God. Now, when he's saying this, this is all tied to Christ. It's not tied to a presidential election. And, and, and we, we, when we read into this stuff, Americanism, we are on very dangerous, idolatrous, and what we're seeing, again, I can't stress this enough, what we're seeing right now is the passive judgment of God, by which Romans 1, God simply gives us over to our delusions. What we're seeing is God giving people over to their delusions. The danger is if they don't repent and they're fully given over, they can become cultic or they can have a psychotic break fully and have a breakdown. Either way, that's what we're going to see unfold if this continues. We're going to deal with the larger problem of the prophetic uh, in our global table next week. I'm going to have Dr. Michael Brown on and 
if you could join us on that too, that'd be great. That's 11 o'clock next week on the 21st. Um, but in terms of uh, the, uh, how would I put it? Let me just, just collapse it down as something simple. And by the way, if you could, there's a bunch of people wanting to know where they could find out the 20 exegetical fallacies. Can they Google it? Um, uh, I, uh, you know, you might be able on, um, on the World Wide Web, if you go to one of the, the scholarly biblical academic sites, there's plenty of sites on exegetical fallacies. And if you've never looked at them, you know, now D.A. Carson in his book on exegetical fallacies covers it quite at length. Um, so they're all covered in D.A. Carson, but he's not the only one that's written on exegetical fallacies or on methodologies. Um, there are some great scholars that I think our tribe would benefit greatly from in terms of methodology. Um, well, even Craig uh, Keener wrote- Craig Keener, Craig Keener, thank you, Craig. Yeah. He's Pentecostal, so absolutely more than yeah. And, and guys like Ken Archer and guys like um, Chris Green um, and and all the other Pentecost Frank Machia. I mean, you, you're talking about Pentecostal scholars that love the move of God, that want to see Christ glorified, and are passionately committed to the fact that the, that the future belongs to the Pentecostals. So we don't have much time left. Um, so 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, what is it, 13, 14, basically chapter 14, uh, it talks about the simple gift of prophecy, you know, excitation, comfort, rebuke. And what I found is that many people are very accurate with individual words. Um, and because they're very accurate with individual words, they think they can now start prophesying to the nation or giving these grandiose, broader prophecies. Um, and it tells us in Romans 12 to prophesy according to our faith. And so from a pragmatic standpoint, it almost seems like some just go out of their lane, maybe because of hubris, uh, maybe because other people are egging them on and saying, wow, you're a prophet. I mean, the Bible says all could prophesy. Just because you could prophesy doesn't make you a prophet. So can you uh, give us a few words on that? And I guess also touch on something some people are wondering. Are you saying that a New Testament prophet should never give a prophecy about their nation? So can you just deal with those two things? And in about 10 minutes, we got to shift to the next table. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me give you an example from my own generation. Um, there was a gentleman that was enamored with the prophetic. Um, and he had a rather large church in Texas, and he had been with me in a meeting at Bishop Donnie Hilliard's in Perth Amboy years ago. Carlton and I had preached there for Donnie, and I, and I had laid hands on a number of people and um, was, was accurate in what I said. The elders there confirmed it, um, was ministering to them. Uh, I didn't minister to everybody. It was a handful of people that I ministered to. And uh, from the very beginning, you, you can never, you can't pay me to prophesy. I, the sovereign spirit gives, you can't, now I may offend some of you, I need you to hear me. Our theology of being able to activate the sovereign spirit is deeply problematic. We cannot activate the Lord, the spirit. What we've invited is for our concepts and our imaginations and our stream of consciousness to be equated with a divine word. And we have actually become Gnostic when we do that. I am opposed to teaching people how to activate the gift. We need to either come up with another way of understanding that and get rid of that word altogether or go back and say, does the sovereign spirit give us permission to practice this stuff? So that, that's, that's, a, that's a deeply, that question goes back well over 40 years in my life. I have never prophesied at the drop of a hat. This gentleman saw me and he brings me to Texas and at the end of the service, he brings everybody up and he expects me to prophesy over everybody. And I said to him, I am not your prostitute <laughs> and you are not. <laughs> I don't prophesy for money. I picked, I had words for some of the people that were profoundly accurate and to the point on where their lives were in relationship to what Christ was doing in their lives. 
when I didn't prophesy over everybody, he got mad at me. He started a church in, New, in, in North Carolina an hour from me and invited, he said, Mark, I'm going to give you a second chance. I said, a second chance for what to come and really do what God called you to do. He begged me, he begged me, I came. And when I got there for the, for the first night, I had a word for the entire church. That wasn't good enough for him. He brought me back to the office and rebuked me for not exercising my gift. I said, I want to remind you, I am not your prostitute and you are not my pimp. You can't pay me to prophesy. I am not going to do that. I refuse. The next night when I came back, I prayed for a few people, but because I didn't pray for the whole church, he withheld most of my offering from me. And I said, you can do whatever you, he's dead today. He ended up back. Uh, he was given over to a drug addiction that he had prior to coming to Christ and preaching. He lost his whole family. Um, it's a very sad ending, but again, that's an extreme example of when we want to think we can prophesy over everybody. We know in part. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And can, can I read you um, something I wrote? Can I read something I wrote? Sure. When it comes to charismatic prophecy, we have confused stream of consciousness. Something needed to be understood about the way the psyche operates based on, uh, if you want to understand that, the, the seminal work of William James, the father of American psychology. When it comes to charismatic prophecy, we have confused stream of consciousness with absolute divine inspiration. The oversimplification of our way of thinking in relation to that place where the human psyche intersects with the divine spirit leaves us open to being greatly misguided and resulting in misguiding those to whom we speak. The terrain of the psyche, though invisible, has been explored by both the ancient doctors of the church as well as contemporary psychology. The, com the commonalities are evident when considered and compared. The avenue for building that bridge is that of the spiritual senses and discernment, according to the early church fathers. The development and maturing of the spiritual senses in relation to actual discernment are an optional. A careful comparison between the spiritual senses and the functions of the psyche psychologically would serve the contemporary church well. More integrative work is needed. That place where the human psyche bonds with the divine spirit requires the delicate understanding of how the spirit influences the functions of the psyche, cognition, intuition, memory, reflection, reasoning, imagining, volition. The spirit does not bypass these domains in order to download, which is a rather spurious and unhealthy term that needs to be discontinued because of its propensity to lead further to misunderstanding and erroneous thinking and speech. You can't download a revelation to your human spirit. Within the sacred text, new and psyche are used interchangeably by New Testament writers. Careful exegesis of the Greek bears this out. The Father speaks through Christ by the Spirit. When God speaks, he speaks in Son. God's language is Son, Hebrews 1.1. God doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak German. He doesn't speak Italian. God speaks Son. We clothe that sense of what God is saying as Christ in our words. The Father speaks the language of the Son in all that the Son encompasses in his self-sacrificial, canonic love that is triune love. The inbreathing of the Spirit from the self-disclosure of the Son's revelation of the Father conjoined with the inspiration of the sacred text shapes and forms the awareness of the prophetic agent to also speak in son and all that that entails. The things on the heart of the father as revealed through the son by the spirit are always and ever tied to the sacrificial witness of the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. The passion of Christ is the consciousness of the triune God. Out of the fullness of that fiery love that is revealed in that passion, the spirit breathes into the prophetic agent who then clothes that in breathing with human fallible inept, stuttering words, attempting ever so weakly to describe the ineffable, the numinous, the holy. The sovereign spirit bears all the consuming fiery love of the triune God as the motivation for all that is to be spoken by the church to a world in need of so great a salvation. The creed declares the work of the spirit with the witness of the church as the prophetic agent. The best, 
a personal prophetic agent can do is address feebly and with fragility the nature of that fiery triune love, where and how that love is violated, where are we held, where we are held to account, and how we are to more faithfully follow the Lamb through his passion to his throne. This all has to be submitted to the church as understood throughout the generations of its existence for accountability and not some open quote new revelation close quote of what the church has all of a sudden become by a new insight never seen before. The errors proliferating presently are not new. They are as old as prophecy itself. Sadly, failure to study history only confirms the repeating of the same errors. Montanism is once again alive and well and flourishing in this hour. Well, for those of you who don't know what Montanism is, just Google it. Um, but they basically focused on the second coming of Christ, the end of the days. They had a Priscilla or Maximilian who were with Bishop Montanus, and uh, he said that their prophecies were equal to scripture, that they were actually uh, higher than scripture in a sense that there's new revelation. And um, it was a precursor to some of the charismania that we're seeing today. So that's why if you don't know church history, you are doomed to repeat some of the same mistakes. But this has been a, an awesome time uh, one, so one thing though, <laughs> this is on everybody's mind and we, we got to transition to the next table in a second and you're welcome to stay on and comment on this table, which has to do with Christian nat nationalism. But, um, the, uh, question is, are you saying that we can't prophesy for the good of our nation? You know, we can't prophesy to our nation basically. Um, uh, personally, I don't believe we can conflate nation state with the kingdom of God. No, I don't. I would avoid it at all costs. That's me personally. Okay. Well, this has been great. And uh, we'll talk again. And uh, maybe we could have a second part in the next week or two. Sure. So yeah. people can let us know if you can. Are you available next Thursday? Because there's a lot of questions people are going to have. There'll be more dialogue. Let me know. You don't have to tell me right now. Yeah, let me, let me hit you back on that, Joe. Yeah, I've got a yeah. Full week next week. But I think that everybody really needs to um, be more theological in terms of, you don't have to become a theologian in, in a sense, uh, like Dr. Mark, but you have to understand some of these hermeneutical principles that we've been talking about. Um, so I'm going to have Vince Thomas wrap this up and then segue over to the global table. The global table is going to have Dr. Michael Brown, Dr. Tony Miller, Dr. Roberta Miranda, and uh, Apostle John Kelly weighing in on what's going on now. Our focus is going to be more on the conflation of uh, Christianity and Christian nationalism. So uh, Vince, can you segue? And again, incredible, incredible, incredible. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark. It was amazing. Yep, I sure can. And welcome everyone as we're preparing to go live on YouTube as well as Facebook. Uh, we're getting ready for just a dynamic global table shifting from a powerful conversation we've had with Dr. Mark Sharona. Um, both of these meetings will be uploaded to their respective sites. The first one is a part of Christ Covenant Coalition. Um, and so you'll be able to see that on the Christ Covenant Coalition YouTube page. And this meeting will be uploaded right where you are, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. Um, the video, once we're done, will be right there. But also for those who are on Zoom, uh, thank you so much for interacting. If we could right now, uh, just as a sign of um, wanting to see where everyone is coming from. Could you let us know uh, where you're tuning in from today? It always blesses us to see how far this table reaches um, and to show that we all can come together and be united around the kingdom of God in such a pivotal time in our nation's history. And today, as we're preparing, I uh, want to also let you all know about this Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, on the eve of the Martin Luther King holiday, we will be having a uh, roundtable discussing 
how we can have a united kingdom. So how can we all unite after such a volatile uh, election cycle, after all that's going on in the world, how can we as the body of Christ and as the church come together and reunite and really talk solutions um, during this time? And so I um, wanna thank you all again for joining today. Uh, for those who now see us on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, if you don't mind doing us a great favor to combat against the algorithm, go ahead and share uh, this broadcast with those that you know and that you love, and I am sure that they will be blessed. So uh, without further ado, I um, want to turn this back over to Bishop Joseph Matera, and uh, let's get ready for a great conversation. Okay. Well, I'm excited that we're here, and I just got a note to send our dear friend, uh, Dr. Michael Brown, the, the link. Uh, so give me a second to send that link over to him. We were busy with our last table that almost ran over. Okay, give me a second, I'm trying to send this to him. All right. Okay, so we're living in extraordinary times, as we all know, and forgive me, I'm outside right now, there's some noise around me uh, in a vacation spot, so I'm trying to finagle things here. But we're living in perhaps the greatest crises that the charismatic church has witnessed in terms of the prophetic errors. And we're going to focus on that next week in the global table. But today uh, I've asked Dr. Michael Brown, Dr. Tony Miller, Dr. Roberto Miranda, uh, and uh, Apostle John Kelly to weigh in on what's going on now in the larger evangelical church and how we should respond in light of the attempted insurrection, uh, the insurrection that's still probably in process, to be honest. There is a huge uh, amount of uh, real rabid Trump supporters that think this is 1776 and um, the uh, call to arms and all that is real and there's many militias and there's many uh people in the church that are caught up in this uh right or wrong you could argue uh whether they are sincere believers or not is not the question but what role does a hyper christian nationalism have in fueling this and is it a biblical position for us to have as christians uh, Dr. Michael Brown, one of my dear friends, a colleague I've been working with closer and closer, has been on this, as we would say in Sunset Park, uh, like white on rice. And I want Dr. Michael to weigh in on this for about 10 or 12 minutes, and then we'll have um, a few others weigh in. So, Michael, thanks for being on. What, do you, what, what can you say about what's going on now? Yeah, this is, a, this is really a critical moment in American history and in the history of the American Evangelical Church. And, and right now, in particular, uh, white evangelicals, because of the strong support for Trump and the, the primarily white presence in, in D.C., and then the fact that, from what we can tell, most of the bad players would be white nationalists, white supremacists, and in the eyes of the world, everything kind of blends together. Uh, David French, a prominent conservative writer who's also a, a strong never Trumper, has raised concerns through the years and people just rejected it as an overreaction. But he wrote a strong article on what he called a Christian insurrection. And he said, look, you had the Jesus flags there, you had the Christian music blaring. This is on the heels of the Jericho March. And, and you had people with Christian flags inside the Capitol. Uh, I wrote an article that should be going uh, live today on different sites, 
saying, no, it was not Jesus loving evangelicals who vandalized the Capitol. And yet the question is, why was there such fervor? Why were so many evangelicals there? How does this tie in with the Jericho March from just a few weeks earlier, where you had the blending together of Christian speakers with people blasting shofars that had a, American banners on them. So the joining together of the kingdom of God with the American flag, uh, where you had one speaker talking about the militias already. So this is kind of a perfect storm. And it, it's really important that, that we as believers, leaders, make clear where we stand and, and who we are and of what spirit we are. Uh, first, let me say we are not at a 1776 moment in American history. Even if, worst case scenario, there is electoral fraud, there are ways that we can fix this and address this. And certainly, almost all Americans want votes, the, the voting to be fair. And if there was really scandalous things, these things eventually will come out. But this is not the time to be storming the Capitol, taking up arms. People say, well, what about 1776? This is not 1776. The elections that just took place in Georgia were conducted fairly. And, and I believe if Donald Trump had campaigned differently and not undermined the Republican Party in Georgia, that we, we wouldn't have the entire balance of power shifting in one direction right now. And, and interestingly, uh, I was told by an inside source shortly before the elections, the presidential elections, that the president's own internal polling showed that he was in trouble. And of course, there was massive campaigning at the end. So the, the fact that he ultimately lost it could easily be explained. But e even if worst case scenario, there's electoral fraud, there are ways that we fix it. There are ways that we work within the system. This is not the time. It's absolutely crazy, outlandish, ridiculous to be making that 1776 comparisons and time to, to take up arms. So you have the radical left and the radical right. And now this is the time the radical right's trying to rise up. Terribly dangerous. But here's the perfect storm. You have on the one hand, believers being more and more upset with the radicality of the left, with the shout your abortion movement, with the LGBT activism, with the fear of where the radical left wants to go. You have the exposing of the extreme bias and hostility of the, the media. You have the rising censorship of big tech. You have all these things happening. Trump comes up as the man who's gonna fight against these things. Yeah, he's, he's rough around the edges and he can be nasty, but hey, look, he's fighting for causes that are important to us. He's pushing back. At the same time, Trump is the guy always telling you, you can't trust anybody but me. Trump is the guy telling you for, for a, a while now, the only way I can lose this election is if it's rigged. You have all this going on. You have coronavirus, which shakes the whole nation also paves the way for all these absentee ballots. There's massive mistrust. You have the rise of the QAnon and the conspiracy nonsense, which to my absolute shock, when Professor Jim Beverly was, was on my show to talk about his QAnon deception book, which, which we published for him, when, when he was on with me, and the moment I announced the show, I got blasted by all these believers on social media. How dare I question QAnon? So, I mean, the conspiracy theory sickness is all through the body. Now you have this election, people believe it's stolen. To this moment, they're still holding out for January 20th. We'll talk about the prophetic stuff another day. So it's this perfect storm together for the moment when all of these radical elements rise up to take back America, take back their country. And then Christians, a lot of them with dominionist theology, are thinking this is the hour with Trump that we move forward with our agenda and the church stands up and rules and reigns and asserts its authority over the society. So all this happening together, it's a perfect storm, and it has really exposed some tremendous weakness in the evangelical church, the charismatic in particular with, with the prophecy errors, but also with an unhealthy nationalism that we have been addressing. There, there is a political seduction of the church. Our social media has been flooded with, with more talk about Trump and more talk about the elections than talk about Jesus and the Great Commission. We've gotten our eyes off the real prize. There has been an idolatrous looking to a man to fight our battles and fix our wrongs. So I believe in the days ahead, even though every Christian leader I know is utterly appalled at what happened at the White House, at the, at the Capitol, even though I believe Trump himself was shocked by what happened, although absolutely, 
I put ultimate responsibility at his feet as a Trump voter for years of irresponsible rhetoric, which can lead to, to this type of, of craziness and violence. When you think this is it, America as we know it, it's over. They just stole our country. We'll never have another free election. This is it for your kids and grandkids. Well, people are gonna to react to that. And people are gonna get violent. But, but ultimately, every Christian that I know that was there, utterly shocked by what happened. When I polled things on, on Twitter, what's left of my Twitter feed with all the people we've, we've lost with the purging and stuff. But when, when I polled on Twitter and I asked, do you know uh, any Christians that approve of what took place in the storm of the Capitol, 80% said they don't know a single one. The same in my circles, the same if we went around here. I mean, we're all utterly appalled. Every Christian leader that was close to Trump, utterly appalled. But we need to look at the larger issues. What contributed to that environment? What, what paved the way for these things to take place? Even though we ourselves want first fostering violence and are appalled by it, what, was there anything in, in our larger teaching, anything that we were part of, any, anything where we hitched ourselves too strongly to a president, at least openly? It's one thing behind the scenes, but openly. Uh, I've, I've talked to, to one prominent leader who was very, very close to Trump, a key person in the Faith Advisory Council, but probably the man closest to him, who to this day can call him on his cell phone. And I asked him, did you warn him? Did you tell him certain things? Did you tell him about, I, I can't get into details, but everything that we would want said to him in terms of warnings to the president about his words, about his behavior, and he assured me he has been a steady voice in his ear doing that very thing for years and his words from first to last. So I know there were people close to him who were warning him, but for the most part, it appears that we were like apologists for the president and that riding on his coattails, we're gonna change America. It, it's, it's almost as if we were looking to a very flawed human being to help us regain our voice. You think, well, I appreciate the good he did. I absolutely do appreciate much good that he did. And hopefully some of it will be lasting, but, but we got our priorities wrong, our eyes in the wrong place. And, and yes, in an unhealthy way, as you've said, Joe, wrapping the cross and the flag. So we've got to step back, do soul searching. Don't, don't let the left-wing media put a blame on us that's not ours. Don't let them cast the narrative that we were the ones that, that killed the DC cop and we were the ones that defaced the, the Capitol and threatened the lives of elected officials. No, we had nothing to do with that, nor would we. But the larger atmosphere, the larger environment, the larger mixing of partisan politics with the church must be carefully examined. And, and if we don't do it now, I don't know that we will do it. So those are the thoughts. Obviously, we could go on for many hours and break this down. But that's the big picture as I see it. Yeah, there's definitely a conflating between the prophetic and Christian nationalism as I see it. Uh, I just saw a, um, a video by Hank Kuhneman a two minute video posted by of all people, Jamal Bryant, and uh, somebody told me about it. And it seems as though Hank is saying that Jesus is gonna come like Rambo on January 20th. It's, you, you could argue it could be an inciting of violence because uh, he talked about Rambo coming with a machine gun on January 20th that he's not gonna come like Mr. Rogers. Um, then you have the historical issue of the manifest destiny of the United States. Some people also intertwine that with white supremacy and colonialism and things like that. But it seems as though there are vestiges of manifest destiny. Many of the people here may not know what I'm talking about. Maybe many do. Uh, and a conflation between that and the kingdom of God and Christian nationalism uh, and so because of our view that God had a specific Christian calling on the nation, that's what they would say, uh, and manifest destiny, uh, the kingdom of God can now be justified as being expanded through the United States. And then at the Jericho March, um, I wasn't there, but I was told, or I think I read it, uh, it seemed as though someone said the militias are coming. Uh, and if that's the case, then there was already 
some kind of connection between some Christians and the, the violence, even though we may not know them, maybe we think we don't know them, but we may know some. So there, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Uh, Tony Miller, what do you say about any of this? Does the Christian message mingle with Christian nationalism, Tony? Uh, is the kingdom of God perpetuated through uh, the political systems of this world? I mean, what, what do you think, Tony? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joseph, for letting uh, me be a part today. And uh, Dr. Brown, thank you for your insightful stuff that obviously helps us greatly. It's great to be with my colleagues today. Let me just share this. As a, as a political science major in undergrad school, uh, that was something that was a part of my life. Uh, I was raised in DC. That was my home growing up. And so being around the Capitol was a part of just a, my, a fiber of being for so many years. And when God put me in ministry, obviously he called me out of that stream in a different way. But here's what I know. There's four things I think that are specific about America that need to be, you know, our hermeneutic matters, how we interpret thing, things matter. And I think one of the things that we're being challenged over in this moment is that we have had sometimes a faulty hermeneutic on how we actually even looked at scripture and looked at the Bible. First of all, America's a nation, right? Acts 17, God sets the boundaries of nations. He sets and raises up nations. Uh, I believe that there's some things about our nation that's been good. There's some things about our nation that's been bad. We have a history. It's impacted the world. And we can freely talk about the good or the bad of our nation. You got you to own it all, right? It's good and bad. There's things we've done well, and there's things we've not done well. And some of that's come back to haunt us even this year in 2020. We, we're facing things that have been long-term issues in our nation that we've continued to uh, kick down the road rather than really actually deal with. Second of all, I think America's a culture. Uh, I've preached in 80 nations of the world, traveled all over the world in every kind of, almost kind of nation you can be in. And I realized that America is a culture. When, you, when people say certain things, they say, well, that's American. That's part of your culture. It's a mixed bag. It has uh, some beautiful ideals and values that it's blessed the world with. I think um, in a lot of ways, it's, we've been a, a blessing. I'm grateful to God for those. But how many of you know that America's also propagated some of the worst evil in the world that's come out of our culture um, because we've condoned it and allowed it? But here's the two things that trouble me most, Joseph, is thirdly, America is an empire. And by being an empire, we're a superpower nation who believes that we have manifest destiny, like you were just talking about, that somehow God has uh, use, wants to use us, like the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the British Empire. Now the American Empire is supposed to shape history. And the problem is God opposes empires. Uh, because he designates that role, as far as I see scripture, he designates the role of that to his son. Psalms chapter two, ask of me and I'll give you the nations as an inheritance that he can shape the history of those things. I don't think that America was born to shape the history of the world. I think we're a part of his story. And fourthly, uh, America or Americanism has become a religion. And when it becomes a religion, it's, it's uh, uh, sacrosanct, it becomes then idolatrous. Because what happens is we make it uh, our love of country almost equal to our love of God. And so therefore we celebrate uh, our national things as if they were kingdom things. I don't think it's wrong to be patriotic. I think it's wrong to put what you are as a nation on the same level of your affection and love for God. I mean, there are people that have even talked about the fact that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights was divinely inspired. So it makes it equal to the Bible. If, if, if that's true, then we're, we're all in trouble, right? John Wesley made this statement in his sermon, The Mystery of Iniquities, that he preached 250 years ago, 200 years ago. John Wesley said this. He said that for the first three centuries, the church never was wounded by persecution. It, it survived and grew and thrived, even in the midst of being very heavily persecuted. But the greatest wound that was ever issued to the church in his estimation, in his sermon, he said, was in the fourth century when Constantine mixed the state with the church. 
and he gave the church riches, he gave it honor, he gave it power, and he gave it prestige and status. And by giving the church that, it wounded it in such a way, and here's his quote, he said, at that moment, the mystery of iniquity was no longer in hiding. It came out full force in front of the whole world like the noonday sun. And I think when you mix state, politics, and religion together, in, even in Christianity, it, I'm going to be very bold. In some ways, what some people are talking about is no different than the Taliban in Afghanistan. They want a, ta they want a religious state that rules everybody according to their value system. We in America want a religious state ruled by our value system. That's not how our God operates. So I believe that we have to come back to a place where we recognize that the church was not meant to, to fight for the seats of power. I believe we were meant to be salt and light. We were meant to influence the earth by the value system of the kingdom of God. Christendom to me is a false ideology. Christianity is a, a, a belief system in Christ and who he is. Christendom is either the product of Constantine and the things that came out of that whole era where we mis mixed Christianity with all of the politics of, of even then later on into Europe. So in my estimation, uh, Dr. Matera, uh, the church has been walking a, on thin ice and we finally broke through. And we're, we're reaping the, the hermeneutic that we've declared over the last 40, 50 years in some ways. And uh, we've got to come back to really seeing ourselves, I think, in the eyes of the kingdom through the word of God. So the fine line is, Dr. Miller, uh, what, and this is the question a lot of people ask, what is, what is the fine line between grasping for power and trying to influence culture? After all, we would all want to influence culture, change the laws, even have Christians at the highest levels of leadership. So what is the fine line between an unhealthy statism or grasping for power and being the salt of the earth and the light of the world? And, and Dr. Brown, you can weigh in on this too. Uh, Go ahead, uh, I'm, Tom. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to respond. I, I think your word is a key word, grasping. I think anything I have to grasp for, manipulate for, and anything I have, if, if I have to sell the values of what I believe to obtain something I desire, I've already put myself in a compromised position. And I believe that the church world has been willing to do that, in particularly in America. Uh, you know, I have the privilege of leading a very diverse congregation. My congregation is made up 30 plus nations. Uh, I have over 55% of the people in my church are people of color. Uh, so I don't have the privilege of standing up with a white nationalist kind of sermon on Sunday. I, I, I wouldn't want to, that wouldn't fit me. I'd, I'd probably break out like on a rash if I had to do that. But if, <laughs> if, uh, if, if I'm honest today, we sometimes preach from the neighborhood we live in rather than preaching from the Bible because the kingdom of God ought to work in every city in every political party in America, because Jesus doesn't identify with any of it. So for us, the issue is we win influence by taking ourselves into a place of walking in humility, caring about justice, making other people's lives better, improving people everywhere we go. I think the more we do that, the more power and influence, quote unquote, power, will have because there's no, if you make other people's lives better, you're going to gain influence in their life. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to have a position, but I think you'll begin to turn the tide of what's happening. And I, I submit that to you guys. Yeah. And, and just uh, on, on the heels of that, by the way, Dr. Miller, what, what great points. Um, well, excellent. I just uh, think you through every one of them. You can expand on them. There's this whole books there, but thank you. You know, uh, I'm not pastoring a congregation, uh, that's not my calling, but I've traveled outside of America about 200 times. And then our ministry school birthed a missions movement, which has missionaries all around the world. So we're working with them all the time. So often when you just have a great commission, world missions mentality, it, it changes some of your thinking. 
Yeah. And then like a diverse congregation, you know, the joke is if you're a Native American congregation or Black congregation, you hear Make America Great Again, it has, sounds a little different in their ears than a white congregation. So a lot of times we just, we have our blind spots. But I, I, I think along with the, the, what was just said about us serving on every level. So a grassroots level, you know, local churches are known for their service, for their heart, for helping people. You know, they're working with the soup kitchen, they're working with the addicts and others. So to me, what has to happen is, you know, Donald Trump yesterday gave a, a brief message to the nation, no violence and let's come together as one. And I thought, boy, if it was that man through the four years, he, he'd went on a massive landslide uh, across the nation for, for other reasons. When we hitch ourselves to someone who by nature is a fighter, you know, New York and can be vulgar and nasty, now that becomes who we are. We, we kind of take that on and, and that's how people look at us. And that's why it was so important the whole way to, to make a clear separation to say, hey, we don't agree with this, we don't like this, but this is what we stand for. To me, if Christians are gonna be raised up into higher levels of office, which yes, we want, we'd love to see Christian professors dominating our universities you know, by their presence. We'd love to see Christian uh, elected officials and with godly policies that would help all Americans. But somehow it's the way that we do it uh, because we don't believe in taking over. We don't believe in a theocracy, but through our democratic republic, we will elect people to offices and appoint judges, and they will make certain decisions that do affect the nation, but it's the tone of it. If, if, if I'm a Christian leader, a Christian politician, I can't do what the others do. I have to say, look, we care about all Americans. In other words, I would, I would be bringing in all the diverse groups and sitting face to face and say, look, we have our differences, make me sensitive to your issues, and we have our differences, at least to try to be Christian in the midst of it, rather than you know what, there, there was a gal, uh, uh, African-American on my, on my feed the other day, and she's weighing in calling me a racist and saying defund, we need to defund the Republicans. And I replied, I said, you know, you don't wanna do that. I said, first, it's not, it's not gonna happen. I said, but if, if you bring one group down by oppression, it's just a matter of time before they rise up and oppress you. It's just the way it is. So we always have to have that mentality and think, okay, what would we not want done to us? What would we react against? How can we be Christian in what we do so it doesn't feel like a power grab? Again, the grasp word. So an important question that you asked, uh, Dr. Matera, appreciate it. Joe, Joe can, I, can I just add something sure. uh, quickly? Uh, you know, my, my question for all of us as leaders is, you know, where are the Wilbur forces of our day? Yep. And I think the problem is, is that we live in a Babylonian society, but somehow we believe it's a Christian culture. The reality is Daniel learned how to thrive in Babylon, but he only learned how to thrive in Babylon, served five Babylonian kings and never lost his, his place in God. But he learned to serve them and thrive there because he learned the language of the Babylonians. And we keep trying to talk Christianese into a culture that is now post-Christian and mm -hmm. wonder why they don't grasp our values. Somehow we have to find the language for the 21st century and be able to take the principles of the word of God and speak them in such a way that we can still speak to college kids, we can still speak to secular society because those values I think are attractive to people. They just don't like the way we wrap them. We put them in packages that nobody can receive them. So how do we begin to find language that can allow us to communicate? I, and I, I, I'm not, this is not about me, but one of the things I did here in Oklahoma City is right after I attended the Black Lives Matter March. And so I stood up on Sunday morning, told my church, I'm going to be attending the Black Lives Matter March to this afternoon. It was on a Sunday afternoon. And, you know, I, I wanted everybody to know. And so <clears throat> because our church is somewhat known in the city, well, the next day in the newspaper, the picture that was on in the front page of the newspaper was me standing in the intersection with a couple of policemen, black and white, some of my staff, black guys and white guys, and some other people in the march praying over our city. So what then happened, one of our senators called me and said, can we meet with you and talk? And I, I went to the meeting thinking it was about something. It, it was about something else. But when I got there, I said to them, I said, tell you what, we, I will host a cultural reformation symposium if you guys will promise to come. 
I believe we have the clout to bring people together from every every society in the city. They agreed to come. I, I had the I had the leader of the Black Lives Matters uh, group over the Midwest that came. I had the head of the NAACP come. I had the president, the vice president of cultural diversity for Oklahoma University come. All these people here, city commissioners, our our, our police chief was here. All these people were here. Here's the issue: the politicians were the ones who at the last minute tried to back out on me because they play to their to their to the pocketbooks of whatever's going to happen. And one of the one of the politicians campaign manager called me and said, I have advised my campaign guy to not attend your event because if he does, he could lose his election because of the question that's going to be asked about how do you really find ways to bridge the gaps between all these things that are happening. And I said to him on the phone, very, very kindly, I said, tell him it's fine if he doesn't come, but I will publicly stand up and tell 2,000 people and the media who's in the meeting tonight why he didn't come. And I'll let him know he didn't come because he didn't want to have his political career in jeopardy. Well, he ends up showing up. But here's my point. My point is somebody, we've got to have dialogue with people, press these guys into a place where they quit just living way over on their polarized positions. And like Dr. Brown was saying, we've got to find a way to have dialogue, to talk, to ask people, how can we find language that we can all communicate with and stop this foolishness of believing that somehow America has a privilege with God that other nations don't have. God doesn't love America any more than he loves Zimbabwe. They are both in his heart and in his kingdom. And we have to find out how to make that happen. Amen. Dr. Roberto Miranda, can you weigh in on this? Uh, Roberto is the head of the New England Alliance, has one of the most, if not the most uh, influential church in Boston, also on the board of governors of Gordon Conwell University, dear friend of mine, we did some conferences together and we've stayed in touch for many years. So Dr. Roberto, uh, what do you say about this? Yeah, uh, thank you, Joseph. I'm honored to be in the company of these two great men, Tony Miller and uh, Michael Brown. I so appreciate your comments, uh, gentlemen. And uh, while being enriched by what you're saying, I'd like to maybe take a slightly different take on some of your uh, viewpoints. Uh, you know, as I hear you, um, it occurs to me, number one, that we are doing the right thing after this debacle, uh, not just of the election, but also this capital invasion, so on and so forth. We are doing the right thing by engaging in some level of introspection, of self-examination, of uh, looking at ourselves and maybe considering some of the mistakes that might have been made along the way over the past uh, four years. I think that's appropriate. That's good. That's necessary. At the same time, I think it, it's important that we uh, do so to the level that is appropriate and not go so deeply that we end up um, doubting ourselves, um, attacking some of the things that at one point seemed the proper strategy, uh, you know, beginning to uh, sort of ingest and um, internalize the rhetoric that we're getting right now from the leftist media. And, uh, you know, we are in a state right now where it, it's, um, it, we are sort of hijacked, we are kidnapped, we are in, inhabiting an environment where we are being invaded by all kinds of uh, media uh, communication. We are being asked to internalize an image of ourselves that we know is false, but it's also a very powerful strategy. We are seeing it from every angle, from every right. newspaper, every TV communication, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to strengthen ourselves psychologically to understand we are right now in a moment of uh, intellectual communications warfare and that we need to be careful that we don't uh, just absorb and buy into everything that is being communicated about us to the point that we end up uh, perhaps uh, you know rejecting some things that were good and that are still good i think we need to keep in mind that this is a long-term process a war, as we know very well, is made up of many battles. And just because an army loses one battle doesn't mean that it necessarily has to just uh, throw away the entire strategy or chuck out all kinds of significant uh, components of that strategy. So I think that at this moment, we need to sort of breathe deeply, 
take a moment and look at things and not necessarily jump to conclusions that are so you know neuralgic, so structural, that we end up throwing things that I think are very necessary in this long-term battle. I think we, we serve a God that is um, strategic in his thinking. Um, he sees, as we have, as we have heard many times said, you know, he sees the three, four, a thousand, a billion times, a billion steps ahead. And, um, this may simply be th this loss of the election and, uh, you know, all the resulting other things may be simply one of those twists of the plot that God has uh, put together. Um, we don't know what's going to happen a year ahead, 10 years ahead. And we may just be in a moment where we just need to, okay, you know, look at things, analyze. Um, but I think we also need to be very careful that we don't overanalyze ourselves and we don't let the rhetoric that's right now uh, dominating the outside lead us into a Hamlet-like situation. Yeah. I think the church, uh, the church of the capital C, the moment that the church enters the realm of history, of politics, of time and space, all of a sudden the church, is, the church loses a certain amount of its uh, value of currency. All of a sudden, as soon as we enter time and space, all this sublime uh, purity that we aspire to, you know, is on the table. Not that we're going to abandon it, but we have to understand that once the church enters into the uh, activity of uh, seeking to influence history, of seeking to disciple nations, of seeking to affect the culture, of seeking to exercise a certain level of government. You know, we, there's a lot of talk these days about ecclesia, and we throw those words and those concepts around often not even knowing what we mean by it but the fact is you know i wrestle with that um the fact is that christ has given the church uh at least agency if not authority over uh history and that uh, we are called then to enter into the fray and entering through the entering into the fray means that many times we'll have to make alliances we'll have to make decisions um we will have to engage in strategies that um, will be questionable, even to ourselves and certainly to our opponents. And we have to have a kind of moral fortitude to engage in some of these actions. Um, uh, knowing that, you know, we have a God who understands our predicament. He knows that he's putting us in a very, in, a, in an almost impossible situation that we are to handle eternal uh, sublime truths and uh, process them within the context of time and space and uh, human nature. I think God knows our, uh, and understands our predicament and he gives us space to uh, sometimes engage in all kinds of um, inconsistencies. And, um, you know, we have to be careful with ourselves. We have to be tolerant with ourselves without becoming careless either. You know, I think that's uh, whenever the church has uh, engaged in, in powerful historical processes, it always ends up doing the same thing. And you, we've, we've, you've talked about uh, the um, Constantine dilemma. Once the church abandoned its place of uh, being persecuted and not being powerful, not having influence, just being able to deal with the spiritual truths and the evangelism and so on and so forth, it was doing great. Once it entered, and I believe that the Constantine situation was God-induced. I think God, Constantine did see that vision Constantine did truly convert to Christianity, but of course he was corrupt inside and he needed a whole lengthy process and the church wasn't strong enough to handle the, the power that all of a sudden came into the church and all the secular influence that came with it as very powerful, influential people entered into the church, baptized physically, but not baptized emotionally or spiritually. And so the church became corrupted. I don't think the problem was engaging history I don't think the problem was in being given power. The problem was that the church internally uh, in, in its, uh, I, I guess in, at the level of its spirituality was not able to, to really resist the influence, the, the uh, dazzling, uh, fe uh, the dazzled feeling of uh, seeing, you know, governors and uh, rich people come in to their churches and still keep the same message of truth and of uh, the uh, scripture. And I think that's what happened there. You look also at another time in, in history, in, in the Reformation. You know, as long as uh, Martin Luther was uh, persecuted and uh, an outsider, not wielding power, it, it was wonderful. As soon as people like him and Calvin and Zwingli and others entered into the sphere of influence, of having to deal with 
concrete facts with uh, the levers of power making decisions uh, about uh, who to ally themselves with. We know that uh, uh, Luther, for example, benefited a lot from the protection of princes that kept them from uh, being put at the stake. And, uh, the, you know, it, once, uh, once the church begins to wield influence, a seduction process enters into place. Satan will try to pervert and uh, corrupt and our own human nature will fail us as well. And I think just the natural processes of the human sphere will enter and we have to then strengthen ourselves in order to fight that. And we have to be very secure in what it is that we believe in and how we are going to channel the spirit of Christ in that kind of corrupt context. And, and I think, you know, the same thing happened to the Reformation. The Reformation was corrupted as well. The Reformation began persecuting those uh, very people that uh, persecuted them and even some of their friends as well. And so, um, you know, I think let's not be surprised that now as well in this past uh, hundred years, maybe even 75, 50 years, that when the church has now here in America specifically, but I think it's something you can find anywhere else in Africa, in Latin America, it's the same story. Whenever the church becomes engaged in power with the good purpose of uh, seeking to do what Christ has told us to do, which is to disciple the nations, the, the, the church will enter into that, you know, that morass of... Uh, corrupt uh, allies and influences and uh, decisions that need to be made uh, regarding uh, politics and so on and so forth. And, you know, we need to, be, we need to um, become aware of that. I think the Catholic Church has known that for, you know, at least a thousand four hundred years that um, when, uh, when it entered into, you know, again, exercising power, political power, you know, the Christendom and so on and so forth, it, it also learned that you know, impurity was a part of the whole process. They, be, they have become cynical as a result of it. And that's what we need not uh, fall into. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make, uh, just to be brief and not to monopolize this thing, is that uh, in this time that we are living right now, we should be careful not to castigate ourselves too much for some of the decisions that we have made. We knew what we were buying into. We knew that uh, Donald Trump was a very suspect resource. We knew that he was a volatile substance that could explode in our face at any moment. We knew that we were really engaging in some very uh, uh, exotic thinking in allowing him to uh, come close to us and uh, in allowing ourselves to use him to a certain degree. We knew that these things were there. I am not sure that we need to repent from having done that. I don't think that, I think that no matter what we do to try to please the world, and even if we dot all the I's and cross all the T's and we speak the rhetoric of social justice and uh, we engage in all kinds of very rich, uh, generous rhetoric, the world will never approve of us. The 21st century culture is more corrupt, more radicalized than ever and it will not approve of us, whatever we do. So we have to learn, we have to be inner directed. And that's enough for, for another observation at some other point. But I think right now God is calling us to look inside ourselves, to strengthen the foundations, to enrich our understanding of scripture, to become stronger as churches, as alternative societies, um, and then to prepare ourselves for the next surge, which will come with the aid of God. I think God is very much in this thing we should not doubt that he has been involved in the past four years as in the past 50 years and that he still has a lot to uh, to engage in on our behalf. So we just, just we should stay steady and uh, just ask ourselves, OK, what is the next stage of things and how do we proceed from here? Well, truly, the evangelical church, in my estimation, out of any other entity, including political entities, castigates itself more than any other group I've ever seen with books written and things like that. Even the scandal of the evangelical mind written by one of us, Mark Knoll, on, on, on and on and on and on. Uh, but you raise some very great practical, pragmatic and pastoral concerns. You're acting as a statesman to us and I appreciate that. Um, and having led a political social movement for 12 years that included people who voted for Obama and McCain and, and uh, on the board. Uh, they didn't know whether to call us left or right, but we were advocating biblical marriage, racial reconciliation, 
NGOs. We ran people for our office. We did all of that. I know how messy it could be. And uh, it's not for the faint of heart. So I'm a practitioner, not just informed by what I read in the Bible, but interpreting what I do through the lens of scripture. So I totally affirm what you're saying. I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, John Kelly, uh, if he is on just to weigh in before we pray. Uh, John Kelly, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, he's uh, Papa Kelly to me. Uh, invariably, the mess of the hyper-Christian nationalists and even what we're going to talk about next week with the prophetic chaos, uh, people are trying to lay it at the feet of the quote-unquote NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. They're trying to lump everybody together as the presiding convener of the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, and uh, as well as, you know, Dr. Brown, who has written and advocated uh, for the delusion of people who think there's some big cons conspiracy of the NAR, NAR. What do you say about any of this as a major apostolic leader? Well, first, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I'm really thankful uh, to be aligned with the brothers that are on this call and uh, listening to everyone and, you know, and Michael's explanation of, of basically the perfect storm. And the perfect storm is a good way of describing the situation that we're presently facing. But one thing I would like everyone to realize is this, is that one ship was lost in the perfect storm. But there were many ships in the perfect storm that made it to the Americas and made it back to Europe, made it to Iceland and Greenland as well. And so only one went down. And that was the one that decided to, to it stayed out too long and, and was facing the storm when it should have been heading back. And so we need to understand, I think the time, the situation that we're in and um, there's a term, military term called snafu and another one called foobar. And um, foobar means um, fouled up beyond all recognition. And snafu means situation normal, all fouled up. And we're basically in a snafu, we're not in a foobar. And we have to realize that that we, we have the ability and the enablement, the empowerment uh, to overcome the situation that we're in. Um, Tony Miller and, and Brother Mirando, I mean, did get a, gave a great explanation. I was really, really impressed. And um, I'll just share, share briefly something. I, as I graduated from high school, I went to work for my father as a high steel iron worker building the Verrazano Naris Bridge before I went to the university on a football scholarship. My father handed me a book to read. I was an unbeliever and it was Iron Rand's book and uh, Atlas Shrugged and I read that. And then the first book I was handed in college was, was a book by Orwell. And, and I began to realize that maybe because of, of the book I read by Ayn Rand, as I looked, as I read the book on Orwell, I saw it differently than my classmates. My classmates saw it as a opportunity to rebel from just about everything. And I saw it as a as something totally else. I saw it more along the line of probably conservative times. And that's when I began to change my political views was during that time. And then of course, when I got saved, I. I totally changed that. So basically, as we're, as we're looking at what we're in, um, I think uh, we must recognize that the enemy is at the gates and throwing stones, especially at the church. And uh, I think it was Brother Miranda said uh, something very interesting at the end. And uh, basically, the evangelicals, I mean, we, you know, right now, between the evangelical, fundamentalist, charismatic, fanatic, dominionist, uh, has created a, a major problem. 
But we also have to realize that that is a minority group, you know, within the evangelical and probably the charismatic movement. And um, so as we, as we look at this, uh, we, we have to realize that we are not going to please um, the world systems. You know, that's not going to happen. They're going to be constantly coming at us. And right now there's a major attack on free speech that's taking place, not only by, by the media and by the tech companies, the, the communication tech companies, but also there's gonna be legislation having to do with hate speech. And uh, AOC has already been introducing legislation regarding that as what is acceptable speech. And which means that sin will be off the table because the moment you begin to speak about the sins of the individual or culture or government or anything in that nature, it's going to be considered as hate speech. So I think we have to realize that we are in an adversarial position, an adversarial world that we're not going to please. At the same time, you know, we, we all stand together against the violence that is taking place. And and we renounce that and we renounce uh, those that have a, a belief in a theocratic government over a nation of any, of any kind and, and Christianity included. And so when it comes to the NAR, which is called the New Apostolic Reformation, you know, there, there's no such thing as an organization. Uh, there's no structure to it. It's more of a thought, it's and more of an imagination of some. And some see it as as a as an as an the evil empire against everything they believe, and others, and they see it as a uh, subversive group. But really the NAR doesn't really really exist. And it's funny, um, Joseph Matera and I at one time uh, we were referred to in a book as being those that profess the NAR and uh, also other things as well. And what was really interesting is uh, I have never, I've never even used the term publicly. And uh, when Peter Wagner coined the term and the definition of it, um, it, had, it had hermeneutical sense to it. it. It had some theological sense to it. But what happened is some that, that followed that, some with, you know, charis, charis, more people that were more within probably what I would consider a revival, prophetic mentality, uh, got caught up in that and has taken that to, to many extremes and have seen that as, and, and, have, and have spoke of dominion, you know, of, of the country and otherwise. And, but we are not of that belief. We're, we're, we're just not of it. And uh, so I oppose uh, those that are of that belief system. I was listening to an, evangelic, an, an evangelist, a Pentecostal evangelist and his son, and they were talking about the five errors, these five errors that are within the apostolic movement and, of the, and how John Kelly believes in these. And, the only, and out of the five, I really only believe in one. <laughs> and that is that the apostolic gift is for today. And the others, I, I, don't, I don't even, I don't believe in. And, um, you know, and that was not only, not only the uh, dominionist uh, uh, theory, but, but be even, even uh, other things as, as well as, as, as dominion. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe, I don't, we don't, we don't profess that. So, but I do think that we need to all come together in a stronger relational way. And that is very, that's very important that we come together in a relational way, not, not as a structure, not as a hierarchy. And problem is when most Christians come together, that's the first thing they do is they establish a structure with a hierarchy to it. I realize that biblically, governmentally, the local church and networks of churches and all must have substructure, must have some form of hierarchical type government with, with a, a single leadership with a council of, uh, of leaders as well. 
but as far as as this, what we're talking about is basically a combination of theology, Christian theology and philosophy. And this is where we must come together and really, really have a comprehensive, pragmatic, theological view of everything that we're talking about. When you start talking about manifest, the manifest destiny of the nation, uh, now, now, now we're stirring up a hornet's nest of another kind. And uh, yet, you know, I, I'm not a great, I'm not a proponent of Christian nationalism, uh, but I am a, a, a proponent of, of the church, the advancing of the kingdom of God, and, uh, and basically uh, the ministering of the word of God in its totality. But so I think that we, we have a lot of, lot of things to work out. And uh, uh, I, I, I know that uh, probably uh, when it comes to the area of repentance, uh, there may be some that need, that need to repent. There have been some prophets who uh, I really commend. I, I really, I, 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 all of a sudden my respect level is going up real high because they have repented of some of the things that they have said, uh, especially having to do with national prophecies. And, uh, but when it comes to the church overall, uh, I agree with uh, uh, Brother Miranda and what, what he shared about that issue having to do with repentance as well. And so I don't wanna belabor anything I'm saying. I don't wanna go, go on too long, but I do think that uh, we have to address the frustration um, that many, many Christians have where, the, where they feel uh, like they're not being heard in the political realm, they're, that they feel like their, their rights are being taken away. And we're going to have to uh, somehow um, address the fact that many, many believers right now have a lack of, of confidence in government, media, and uh, tech communications, and also a lack of sense of basically, um, well, uh, just just so much stuff. And they, they really lack an understanding of church history. And the one thing I know about church history is the church has gone through many trials. It's gone through many sufferings and many persecutions. But the amazing thing is the church has overcome. It has constantly overcome. And, and I have great faith that the church is going to overcome. And when I say overcome, I mean, I mean that it will overcome. And once again, once again, it will, it will be, be an influence. It'll be an influence having to do with moral virtue and principles, uh, basically within within culture but but it will not be a theocratic government in until Jesus comes and so that's that's where I see some differences um, among uh, a few but but basically we have to really get back to our basics of preaching Jesus preaching the kingdom preaching the entirety of the word of God and, and that's where I definitely agree with Tony Miller and Brother Miranda. And we have to understand that in our pulpits, people right now are hurting. People are confused. People are frustrated. And they don't need us getting in the pulpit and preaching to them like generals. But we need to be in the pulpits as fathers and mothers and giving them pastoral care to overcome their hurts and their, con their frustrations that are within them. And, and, and to be ministers of healing, ministers of reconciliation, rather than ministers that are constantly in an adversarial mindset. And so there are some ministers, there are, there are probably many ministers that need to repent of being in that mindset. And so I'm just sharing some thoughts, just basically right here off the top of my head. And uh, I'm just so pleased uh, to be surrounded 
with such a group such as all of you. Man, well, we want to thank you, uh, Apostle Kelly, Papa Kelly, and we have already uh, exhausted all of our time. So I'm going to ask uh, Bishop Kyle Searcy to pray for the church, pray for the nation, and then give it over to Vince Thomas. And next week, we're going to be dealing with uh, the prophetic delusion that's going on in the body of Christ. Uh, I'll be joined by uh, Dr. Brown and, and a few others. Uh, and then remember this Sunday night, we're going to be dealing with the need to unite the body of Christ. Uh, this uh, past election has further polarized the white and black church uh, and to an extent the Hispanic church. So Sunday night, I'll be uh, one of the keynotes. Uh, we'll be dealing with this eight o'clock Eastern time. Look for it through email, social media. Um, I think it's an important time for us to understand how to bring healing to the body of Christ. So uh, Apostle Bishop Kyle Searcy, can you pray? Sure thing, uh, Bishop. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the wisdom that's been released. We thank you for the insight that's been shared. We thank you that you're giving us the right course for this course correction. We thank you that you're reclaiming our identity as the church. We thank you, God, that the dross is being washed away. We thank you that the drag is being lifted so we can fly at the altitude you've called the church to fly at. Thank you, God, for the men uh, who, are, who have insight and who have wisdom who have poured into us today. We ask you continue to enrich us, encourage us. Lord, bring the church together. Let this not be one of the of things that further divide us. God, bring us together. Let us hear common sound, cause us to realize we're dealing with a common enemy and cause us to remember who that enemy is. God, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Heal hearts, restore relationships, and reclaim our identity in a huge way. We thank you, God, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Well, as uh, Bishop Batera has already laid out the upcoming events, um, you can always go back on our Facebook and YouTube sites to watch all of our previous tables as well. Uh, if you want to find out more about how to support US Cal and so into US Cal, you can go to uscal.us. On that website, you'll also find out ways to join a part of this network of like-minded leaders. So that's all our time for today. Hopefully we'll be able to catch each of you all on Facebook and YouTube on Sunday evening. If not, we'll see you next Thursday. God bless. Amen, amen. A minute to say goodbye. Appreciate all of you. The uh, incredible job, Tony Miller, Roberto, oh. Papa Kelly, Michael Brown.